the invasion of China was underway, and the state of Manchuria was established as a puppet by the Empire of Japan. This country was not acknowledged by anyone, and they were under the pressure of legitimizing their country. So, they sent a letter to the young Qing Emperor Henry Puyi to rule the country if he wishes to do so, and he did. Well now, who is Puyi, and why he accepted the invitation from the Japanese army? Not so fast now. He will take each section case by case. I already see a lot of videos about Puyi, so I took a different approach this time and mainly used his autobiography as a source, unless the information provides is inaccurate or a crucial information is missing from the text. This way, it will be much more interesting to get along with the story of the last emperor of China. Also a fun fact, Pui is possibly one of the only and the last Chinese emperor that has photographed, as well as his voice being recorded. And no, I don't count women. Henry Puyi was born in 1906 in the Forbidden Palace, a world inside a world. When Puyi was chosen to be the monarch of the Qing Empire at a very young age, the country was in a bad situation. Actually, it would be an understatement to oh, call it bad. Shit. People were being more and more open against a foreign monarch. Revolutionary forces were plotting to take over the country, and the corruption of eunuchs was taking a serious toll on the government. He grew up in a place where he was not aware of the outside world. Him being a child didn't help either. It was during these times that Yuan Shikai would betray the monarchy. At one hand, he was wise knowing that days of monarchy were limited, and on the other hand, he would be able to control the country as a sole leader. With these motives, he urged Puyi's regents to abdicate the monarch, and in 1912, he did. In his autobiography, Puyi says that he saw Yuan crying with the old Empress Shi his niece, saying that he would never betray the monarch, and there he was, asking, almost pushing for the abdication. Truly, this man was a rascal aiming to have power and nothing else. At least, with the favorable treatment for the King Emperor after his abdication, he was allowed to stay in Forbidden Palace, albeit having to abandon some parts of it as they were used by the Republicans. Puyi was also paid handsomely Smoke to live in his day. bubble, having little to no clue about the outside world. In his words, he lived a pointless and purposeless life. Yuan tried to be emperor himself, but he died after a couple of months. Now the basics are over, it will be useful to talk about his childhood in a general sense, to unveil the mystery of his life. The simple matter of fact is, he never felt the love of her mother, and worse, her actual mother will overdose on pure opium because of a heated event. The emperor and his blood mother were humiliated and she couldn't handle that fact. I had a lot of mothers, yet I never felt the love of a mother, he says. All the wives of the emperors were his mothers, and they had little to no interest in Puyi. The people he mostly interacted with were eunuchs, for a lack of better word, slaves. They had to do whatever he wanted them to do, like I don't know, eating darn soil because Puyi wanted to see if he would do it, like here is the text, it happened. While a few high-ranking eunuchs lived a luxurious life, the rest lived on the brink of starvation. At least there was a wet nurse who was the only person who could make Puyi listen to her. He didn't get the chance to know his father well either. The only people he was close to were a few servants and his tutors. The most famous of them all, Reginald Johnston, his British tutor. He would be the one who gave the name Henry to Puyi. For an emperor, he was kind of silly goofy even. The books he read were often devoid of actual knowledge and mostly had goofy a Confucian texts. There were some information in these books on how to be a good ruler, but it was not enough for Puyi. Up until 13 years old, the only book he read was 13 classics, which was the tenets of Confucianism. English lessons were added in this age and he got another book, which is Alice in Wonderland and another damn Chinese book but now it's translated into English. Blood was supposed to be a ruler of the whole China and he didn't know simple math, physics and chemistry, something a high schooler will be familiar with back then. He says, if I was not keenly interested in things around me, I will probably never know where Peking was or that rice grew out of the ground. His British tutor, however, tempered him and made him a good student. 
His patience would make Puyi adore him as a tutor. Johnston might or might not have realized how deeply he influenced the student to the point that Puyi would question everything Chinese. This arduous life continued for 13 years. He was reinstated for a brief period and almost got expelled but negotiated his way out of it. Sometime later, he will be forced to say goodbye to Forbidden City suddenly and violently. When he left the palace to greet the Republican army outside, he would gloomily say, I have felt some time that I did not meet the articles of favorable treatment, and I am pleased to see them annulled. I have no freedom as emperor, and now I have found my freedom. There was a hint of truth in this, as the palace life got to his nerves, and the corruption inside made him feel helpless. After all, how was he going to be a ruler if he couldn't even put order in a place thousands of smaller than China itself? He made plans with Johnston to escape to the British legation in Tientsin. There were several countries who had concessions in Tientsin and British had obviously had one here. God save the Queen. Plan kinda got busted and after hearing no news from his friend Johnston, who was supposed to be back from British legation, Puyi took matters into his own hands and they moved to the Japanese part of the city. His father, whom he despised throughout his life, tried to persuade him to come back to his place, but Puyi did not give in. And here's a fun fact before we leave Forbidden City behind for a long time. In size, Forbidden City is very similar to Vatican City. The former one is 961 meters long and 753 meters wide, while the latter is a little over 1 kilometer long and 850 meters wide. I should say that while he did not like Forbidden Palace and the people around him, he was not giving up on his dreams of restoring the Qing Empire. This was one of the many reasons why he departed for Japanese legation. He knew that they would forcefully occupy Manchuria at some point and kept himself content with the fact that if he couldn't persuade enough loyal Chinese and Manchu generals, the Japanese army was with him. After all, if he could convince the people of Manchuria, there was nothing that could stop him from becoming the ruler of China once again. To his disappointment, warlords who were loyal to him were crushed by Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang. So pretty much the only people who could help to re-establish his throne was the Kwantung army. Banning everything in this, Puyi sent his brother Pu Chie and his brother-in-law to Japan, where they would study in a military academy and create connections in noble families. By this time, we would notice that the Japanese were not the kindest to him as they would sometimes frighten him through dubious ways to make him more dependent on them. We would meet with an influential member of the Black Dragon Society, a Japanese espionage organization, to discuss several topics and check his pulse on his opinions about restoring him as the emperor. While he was somewhat relieved to know that, this organization was seeking ways to restore him, he would also learn that they managed to seep into every crack of Chinese society, destabilizing it every way possible. Whether it was smuggling opium or funding poor Japanese warlords, they would do it. I would imagine learning this path put Henry in a very uneasy situation. He would also be accompanied by a Japanese policeman whenever he went outside. Puyi was a man who didn't know love, and he was aware of this fact. So when his consort Wen Shu asked to divorce him in 1931, he complied. He was also aware of the power inequality. Let's listen to it from his mouth. Frankly, I did not know anything about love. In other marriages, husband and wife were equal, but to me, wife and consort were both the slaves and tools of their master. She would become a primary school teacher and die in the 1950s. One reason I brought this up is that when Puyi was first given pictures of women to marry, he would first chose Wen Shu, but the court forced his hand to make another prestigious woman, Wang Rong, who make empress and make Wen Shu his consort. Wang Rong will really realize the horrible mistake she made by falling into the hands of this man. Just know that she will be a very miserable person. As Chiang Kai-shek occupied Manchuria and all hopes seemed to be lost for Puyi, the Mukden incident will occur. After a false flag operation, Guangdong army would move to occupy Manchuria, eliminating Feng Tian clique once and for all. This gave a real opportunity for Puyi to move and establish his independent kingdom. Only after ensuring the fact that he will be the sole monarch with Kenji Doihara, who was in charge of the Japanese army and Manchuria at that time, he departed the Mukden with the help of the Japanese. 
He will be escorted to a restaurant and to a small boat with Japanese soldiers in it. This was done at midnight so that the Chinese wouldn't make attempts on his life. Let's say if their escape will be impossible, they will just blow the boat with an incendiary bomb. You can read more of it here. A horrifying realization indeed. This was not done without criticisms, however. His advisors were horrified by this affair and some of his family members wrote to him, saying to not acknowledge enemy as your father. There were some bare-bones assassinations attempts, but these were intercepted by Japanese police. During his stay in Port Arthur, he was not allowed to see anyone and had to change their location to a different hotel for a while. Because the Japanese government itself was confused about who to put in charge of the government, of this newly established state and they were considering their options which was not what Doihara said to him fearing the worst they could only wait and the worst indeed happened provisional government of Manchukuo would announce that it would establish itself as a republic it was composed of high-ranking Manchu officials who were already subservient to Kwantung army this infuriated him as well as most of the people around him he would later meet with Seishiro Itagaki personally, who was in charge of the stuff, and he gave the sad news that he was not going to be installed as the king emperor, but as the president of a one-party government. They argued over it for three hours, after which Itagaki smugly insulted him and left. It did not go anywhere later too, and Pui had to accept this proposal, hoping that it would be just a transition period. This decision was officialized on March 5, 1932, after a little show. For a while, Hui will be in an uneasy mood and everyone around him will try to cheer him up by saying this was just temporary. It was just a matter of time until he will become the ruler of China as a king emperor. As they arrived at Changchun on March 8, he saw various Chinese and Japanese people greeting him and waving old yellow imperial flags. This made him very happy to the point of tearing up. After all, they were very happy to see their benevolent emperor who came back to claim his throne. He started to work diligently and become a man of habit. He did what Kwantung army wanted him to do in order to get on their good side so that they would support restoration when the time came. It did not take a long time to realize that he was a pawn, something to be played in the grand scheme of things. He was the chief executive of Manchukuo and supposedly in charge of everything in the state. In reality, he wasn't in charge of anything. He was just a puppet of the Japanese Empire. He says, I didn't even have the power to decide whether or not I could pass out of the door to go for a walk. There was an important figure I refrained from mentioning up until now, and that is Cheng Shaoshu. He is mentioned very often, especially he left Forbidden Palace. He was a docile and a loyal man, which would make the impression of a sly man who was ready to collaborate with others if a situation get troublesome, but that is not the case at all. It was just that he let Puyi do whatever he pleased, and sometimes acted behind him but not against him. His loyalty to Puyi and his disagreements with the Japanese got him killed in the end. He was the Prime Minister of Manchukuo. He will be discarded from his position with the excuse of his enthusiasm for international control of Manchukuo and die under dubious conditions three years later. He was not wrong though. In this way, Manchukuo will be a little more independent from Japan and prosper a little bit more. But this plan of the League of Nations didn't work and Puyi will become an emperor only in name. A puppet, no, a slave to the Japanese. To be completely sure that his title of emperor will be bestowed upon him, he sent a loyal Japanese guard of his that he admired, Tetsusabuo Kudo, on his behalf. He was loyal to Puyi as much as the most devoted Qing official. For this reason, he sent him to the Tokyo to discuss the topic with delegates. The answer was positive. There was a caveat though. They were not acknowledging him as a Qing emperor, but as the emperor of Manchukuo, which infuriated him as he wouldn't be allowed to wear the dragon robes of the Qing dynasty. Another Puyi L it is. Of the intense negotiations which were done by Cheng, he will be allowed to wear it to pay tributes to heaven. Still, not in the actual ceremony though, as he had to wear the marshal's uniform again. At least Prince Shishibu, the brother of Hirohito, came to congratulate him on behalf of the emperor and gave him gifts, which alleviated some uneasy feelings in his heart. One day, his family would visit him 
and they congratulated him. This momentary euphoria was broken by the next day, as a Japanese delegate came and he was mildly berated for it. He sent armed guards to welcome their family members in the train station, which was under the ownership of South Manchuria Railway Company. Only Japanese soldiers were allowed in this place. He says, This incident should have been enough to awaken me from my dream world, but at least on this occasion, the Japanese showed me courtesy of not protesting it openly. And after I sent someone to apologize and insist that it wouldn't happen again, they didn't bring it up. He would visit Japan to meet with Hirohito, and on the way, he was pampered so much that he forgot who he was. All of the misgivings of the past were forgotten after his illustrious trip. When he came home, he foolishly thought that since Hirohito and he are equal now, he had as much authority as Hirohito, and disloyal to him was disloyal to Hirohito. His boosted ego would deflate like a balloon when he learned that less than a month after he visited Tokyo, Cheng Shoshu was forced to retire by the Kwantung army and found another man for his position. That will be Shang Xinghui. He was one of the commanders in the Fengtian army and collaborated with the Japanese. Cheng was not allowed to go anywhere out of the city and would be under constant surveillance. He died shortly after his son passed away. Even this didn't convince him enough that he was a mere puppet. But given enough time, this fact will be ingrained into his mind without a shadow of doubt. First, it started with Kwantung army killing a loyal Manchu general and his family. Then a Mongolian prince snitched on him by saying he was not happy with the Japanese administration of the Manchu court. But he shrugged it off and blamed the prince instead. The third was the most obvious one and he got very lucky here. Let me explain. His brother came back to Manchukuo after he graduated from the Japanese army cadet school. And the Japanese were urging him to marry a woman from Japanese nobility. Hui was not stupid, so he saw through this and warned his brother to not give in under any circumstances. His brother couldn't handle the pressure so he gave in and married Hirosaga, a Japanese noblewoman. This confirmed his worst fears, as the Manchu council would pass a law that guaranteed this Japanese boy to the throne if Pui himself couldn't give a male offspring. Thankfully though, the child was a girl. If it was a boy, there was a good chance that they could be both poisoned by this Japanese woman and the child would just take the throne. This would coincide with times of his lowest mental health. Pui knew very well the Japanese even seeped into his close family and there was nowhere self to freely talk and complain. At dinner table, he will first watch to see everyone eating the food, and he will eat it later, and this was just one of the minute things he did. He was also urged to marry a Japanese woman by Yoshioka, who was pretty much the middleman between Kwantung army and him. He insisted on marrying a Chinese woman instead, and seeing his effort bearing no fruits, Yoshioka came in for this time. She would unfortunately pass away after her Japanese doctor who was taking care of her gave an injection. It was most likely a type of poison. On July 7, 1939, Pui had little to no hopes of being the emperor of China, let alone eating his damn food without worrying about being poisoned. From now on, he could only worry about his safety and how to deal with the Japanese, inside and outside at home, as well as his cabinet discussing nothing with him and just being obedient dogs to their masters. He was not allowed to do anything without the consent of the Kwantung army, and this meant there wasn't much to do. He became lazier and his sleep schedule would worsen. He says, apart from my eating and sleeping, my daily life could be summarized as follows. Floggings, medicine, fear and divinations. His mental health and his physical health was in ruins. It got even worse as it was becoming apparent that the Japanese would lose the war. He thought they would kill him and there could be a hint of truth in it, had he gotten too disloyal and dared to complain about the glorious Japanese army. He would flog people at the slightest agitation, only eat vegetables and pray to Buddha and other gods for protection. He would cater to the Japanese even more and more, so that they wouldn't finish the deed by shooting him in the face. He also admits it himself that he is a very cruel person, so this likely strengthened his sadistic habits. He would straight up torture his staff sometimes, and if you, the person who was supposed to carry this punishment out, 
slowed down even a tiny bit would get flogged instead. This could happen to anyone in the household, so everyone was on their nerves all the time. Except for his wife, everyone could get and did get flogged. Even orphans that were brought up were no exception. I will pass this section from my mental being as well as yours. He was powerless outside of his house, but he was the absolute ruler of this palace. It is both tragic and amusing to read what he has done to himself as well as others around him. This wouldn't last forever, you see. The Japanese were losing the war day by day. This would get more and more obvious to everyone as the courtyard they stayed in turned into a military base with soldiers going and coming everywhere. Chief of the staff of the Quantum Army in Manchuria, Yasunawa Yoshioka, whom he met regularly, was less lucky than him as he died in a nameless prison at Manchuria in 1947, while Puyi and his family tried to leave by plane at Mukden. The airstrip was captured by Soviet troops which proceeded to disarm every airplane in the airport. They were waiting for a bigger plane to leave as the previous one they boarded was too small. Serves him right for leaving one of his wives to be captured by the Soviet troops. He doesn't say who this concert is though. Also, he remarks that before he left, for a couple of days, he couldn't even have a proper meal as most of the servants scattered to the countryside, so he had to resort to eating crackers. Before we move to his captivity in USSR, I would like to mention something that he didn't during the part of his stay in Manchukuo. His wife would have affairs with other people since Pui never really cared about her, so she sought attention from other people. On one of those occasions, she got pregnant. Puyi knew this baby wasn't his and in a moment of rage, he yeeted the baby. It is contested whether his wife lived in her happy ignorance or found about it and became even more wretched, spending every moment of life in misery and opium. They were moved to a spa hotel in Chita and the commandant of the Chita military district welcomed them to the hotel. They had a comfortable life here, but some people begged them to be able to return to their families. But the gist is that he doesn't even know what will happen to him, so how is he supposed to let them go? He discussed this with the Colonel Volokov, who was responsible for them, and the only answer he gave was a swift, I will submit your message to the higher-ups. Nothing came from this. He spent some time before being moved to Khabarovsk. They had three meals a day and were given a Soviet gazette with a radio, so they had some idea of what was happening outside of the hotel. They had a small garden in the courtyard, which was given to them, and in here they planted vegetables. Pui would also help to water these crops, and he very much loved it. It was something he has never done before because he was a monarch, duh, and I think this is where his interest in gardening started. I think it shows the reality of how he was a child, even if a cruel one, at heart. He didn't care about the Chinese Civil War that much because he knew he would be at best imprisoned for life, or worst, publicly executed for being a traitor. People around him were somewhat hopeful of a victory for Kuan but the reality was a far cry from their dreams. Soviet authorities issued them books like Problems of Leninism and the History of Soviet Communist Party. Besides that, they would lecture his family and Puyi with these books. While Puyi didn't care that much at first because his garden was more interesting and delicious, he would be more interested in them unlike some of his family members as time carried on. This doesn't mean he changed his mind on whether he was guilty or not. To him, might was right, so he was very close to the Soviets and hoped that by telling what he knew, they would let him stay there, rather than going to China. He was put in Tokyo trial nonetheless, but as a witness. After staying there for an unnerving 8 days, he was sent to Manchuria, but as a prisoner this time. He was 44 years old. He will be transported by a train, and he was accompanied by Soviet soldiers who gave him beer and candy. It was of utmost importance that he was to be calm and collected. But how could you calm someone down when he was sure that he was going to be killed the moment they step into communist China? After being unable to sleep from anxiety, he would soon have a mental breakdown and finally have a deep rest. But still, he had a lingering anxiety for a while as he was expecting to be shot whenever the train stopped. He was so sure that when he was brought to a place to rest, he only focused on eating the apple that was on a desk and told your soldiers to be done with it, but all the responses he got from this was laughter. For five days, he thought of nothing but death, and this would mess with anyone's head, but eventually, he rested for a while. 
whatever his punishment will be, it still beats being publicly shot or hanged. He was locked in a military prison with a few of his relatives and some collaborators from Manchukuo. They weren't treated like ordinary prisons as they were given clean clothes, books and newspapers to study, and even cigarettes. They would learn that this place used to be a Manchukuo prison and now communists were using it. The brief relief of this situation didn't last long as he was transferred to a new room and started the process of his brainwashing with the first step, isolation. At first, he was scared like a child and asked to be moved to his family cell again for a little while longer. It was accepted. After 10 days, however, he was moved to a previous cell. He asked to see his family once a day privately, and this request was accepted. What a scared 44-year-old man, I know. New issues arose in this new cell though. I would like to remind you of the fact that this man used to be a king, and kings don't make their food, they don't clean their clothes, and they certainly don't sharpen their scissors, which Pui had to learn now. He lived a life without doing anything useful, so it was time to do something and become self-sustainable. It would take some time to adjust himself to his cellmates as he was always behind on something, whether it was cleaning his clothes or bathing. This was a problem for sure, but it was better than being made fun of by his cellmates. These were the former officials of the Manchukuo regime and these people were making fun of him behind his back. This got worse after one of the communist higher-ups who visited his cell told him to be tidier, and even though he did not have a malicious tone or intent, Puyi was still drowning in embarrassment. He and bunch of people would be moved to Harbin from Fushun. This place was built by the Japanese but they refurbished by the communists. It was called the Dot Control Center. A very ominous name indeed. It certainly gave away a miserable aura and worst of all, you didn't even have a place to sleep other than the concrete floor. Eventually, Korean War started, so these prisoners were worried that if China were to lose the Korean War and somehow the USA attacked China, they would be shot before communists left Manchuria. During this time, a higher up came and assured them by saying they were not going to execute prisoners. They were looking to remote these people to change themselves and be reborn. If they wanted to execute them, it would be sooner a long time ago. Also, he assured them of a total victory on the Korean front. This East Puyi and the others for a while. After the Korean front was stabilized, Communist Party members would take the initiative in the thought reform experiments. They were mostly free before during their studies, but now it was changed. One of the members kindly asked them to write an autobiography of themselves. This way, they would face themselves with absolute objectivity and reflect on themselves. This made Puyi wonder, were they doing this to secure a confession and put them on a public trial. With this in his head, he went to one of his attendants to say that he should cover for him since communists were still hopefully believing that he was kidnapped by the Japanese to Manchukuo. This attendant, Big Li, was the only one whom he actually helped him when he departed to Mukden from Tientsin, so he was a witness in this case. He also wrote his autobiography this time, except he made most of the things up after he was expelled from Forbidden Palace to save face. But this wasn't enough in his eyes, so he would try it again later. He would also notice that Big Lee's behavior changed over time. He would usually help him with his things, but it seemed like their relationship soured. Not only him though, most of his family and servants were distancing themselves from him. They were changing, and none of them wanted to wash his clothes or help him with anything. He was left to himself, and himself only. Loneliness would pick him apart during this time. Even the closest people to him were telling to his face that he was guilty and should confess to his crimes. So, he confessed. His first confession was telling the center chief that he had jewels in his suitcase and expected to receive his punishment. He wasn't really, and this act of encouragement was praised by his cellmates, who were making fun of him all time now. It was as if he was one of them now. He was also visited by a party official to inspect the prison and see what were they doing. They had a brief but tense discussion with him. Here it is. He was very much affected by this discussion and he went to write in great detail about what he has done in Tientsin and how he went willingly to Manchuria. At the end of 1952, they were moved to a bit more comfortable place where they had at least had wooden boards to put their beds. They were also put in a pencil factory to work for 4 hours a day. The rest of the day was spent studying at the prison center. 
He wasn't good at labor, which resulted in people criticizing him. Worse, he would get a high fever and was bedridden for half a month. During these days, he grew a hatred against the palace he grew up in. In the end, it was them who made him a man-child, growing him up in a place that had no connection with the real world and making him not knowing the simplest things a child knew. They would study for a while more until they were told to write everything they knew and send it to higher-ups to see how much they remold. Hoi would read what people wrote about him as everyone agreed on telling the truth and showed their defense to each other to discuss it. Reality struck him or eliminated him per se. Back then, he saw himself as the last Manchu emperor, so whatever he has done to claim his throne was justifiable in his eyes. Yet, now he was just like every other person. He was a factory and a laundry worker. There was no use in denying anything. Another realization was that he was in fact a coward. A coward who only sought to preserve himself and didn't care about the pain and misery he caused to others just to live another day. Is the life you live at the moment worth it if you only cared about yourself and if you have no one but yourself? It seems like Puyi realized this and for the first time maybe decided to be honest with himself and to everyone else. He still couldn't get rid of his subconscious emperor habits though. It would take some time to get rid of them eventually. Since they were in the prison for a long time, they visited the countryside to see how the communes and city life works. They introduced themselves to people around and Puyi was worried that he would be yeeted by a mob if they got worked up on him, which didn't happen. They visited the village and Puyi would apologize to them for the hurdles they went through during the Manchukuo regime. Later, Puyi would play and act in a theatric play and nail the performance. Seeing him genuinely having progress in remodeling, on December 4, 1959, Ai Shinji Puyi received a special pardon from the People's Court of the People's Republic of China. From now on, he visited the Forbidden City once again and become a gardener at the Peking Botanical Garden. People were always kind and nice to this old man and he was very interested in this new world. He would walk around the city and do whatever he liked. He could also write the world, which made him quite happy. It was better to rejoice with the commoners than to be alone on the throne by yourself. Huyi will pass away from cancer on October 7, 1967. Man was the first word I had learned to read in three words class, my first primer as a child. But in my previous life, I had never appreciated the true meaning of his first four lines. When a man is born, his nature is basically good. Human nature is similar. Only environment makes it diverse. In the end, we should neither think of him as a monster nor as an infallible monarch, but as a human being with flaws because he genuinely tried to better himself and looked at his life with the purest form of objectivity to an extent. This book is the proof of this fact. There were a couple of things he didn't mention that I did, but one exception should not absolve himself of the progress that he made. Thanks for watching. Make sure to follow and like the video.